Okay, welcome everyone to our first meeting of the year. Happy New Year. Thank you for joining us. Thanks to all watching. Would you all please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, we need a motion to move out of executive session, please. So moved. By Jan and second by Mike. All in favor? Aye. And any changes to the agenda? I don't believe we do. Okay. Our first order of business is to welcome Dan White, Monroe BOCES 1 superintendent. Thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to sit and talk with you very briefly this evening. I want to extend my regards from Tom Despecca. Um, he got called away on uh, NISBA business, so he's unable to make it tonight. But we're going to make a very short visit back in April um, so we can attend a board meeting. And we had intended to show you a, vi a video tonight of some of our student based programs just as an update. I'm going to hold that off until April when Tom can be here. It's actually kind of his idea to do a video tour of it. So would like for him to be able to see the to be able to see that so um so thank you anyway um a couple of things first of all try to get around annually to board just to simply say thank you to you um we are a cooperative and we are only as strong as our partnerships with our component districts so webster is always a fantastic partner um, and we, we sincerely appreciate it um you know carm sits on our management steering committee which is the most fun committee that's possible to sit on he does budgets and capital <laughs> and so forth and um and policy. policy, you got it. <laughs> policy You're general. right. I'm sorry. Policy is even everyone's better. Everyone's envious. Um, and it, Brian's obviously very, very active on committees and also, uh, also our, um, with our um, business officials and, you know, obviously Brian and so forth. So we're, we're, we're very thankful for the partnership that uh, we have with this organization. So that leads me to one of the main reasons that I wanted to talk with you this evening in brief. And I understand the business officials had a pretty detailed meeting today, um, so I expect you'll be hearing more about that. But we are at BOCES um, intending to embark upon some more significant capital work. Um, I know you're coming to visit as a board, I think, sometime in March, so you will mm -hmm. see. That's great. You're always welcome to do that. Um, you'll notice that facility was built in the early 60s. Um, it had a significant renovation about 25 years ago, but we do have some needs now that we have been postponing because of various reasons. We've been picking away at some things, but there's some more substantial work that needs to be done. One of the hindrances to us and, what, and to BOCES around the state is uh, debt service or local debt service on capital is not exempt from the tax levy cap for BOCES capital as it is for school district capital. What that does essentially is that puts upward pressure on school districts tax levy cap when you're developing your budgets. We do not want to do that. So we've had some pretty detailed conversations over the last two or three years with our committees trying to determine ways we can get some capital work done without affecting districts tax levy cap. So there's been a lot of discussions. Um, we believe that we've um, you know, in collaboration with our committees and our, our uh, business officials, we believe we've come up with some options for school districts so that does not happen. Our goal is obviously not to put that upward pressure on your budgets. Um, almost every single one of our components often is very close to their tax levy cap when they go out. So we do, we do not want to put that pressure on there. That being said, we do have some work that needs to be done. You'll, you'll be able to see when you come over to the Foreman Center. It goes out saying that the nature of the programs we run for um, very involved students and also career and technical education are infrastructurally intensive um, and they do require us to do significant upgrades from time to time. So we obviously have come at this from a standpoint that we are being sensitive to the financial situations of districts um, and not wanting to add to any stress that districts have on that. But yet we do want to provide appropriate facilities for your kids that are coming to us for programming. So that's really a quick update. So I'm going to pause for a second there to see if I can answer questions on that or you know anything else you might have so I guess yes I, I guess I'm interpreting that as if you were to do a capital improvement 
project sure. then each of the various school districts that participate in BOCES would have a part of that. Is that what sure. you're saying? So Jan, that's a great, it's a great question because actually by law, component districts, BOCES really doesn't own their capital, it's owned by the component the districts, right. the yeah. cooperative per se. So they each have a, a, a piece of, of doing that, which is why if our capital is not exempt from the tax levy cap, it puts pressure on all 10 component districts levy calculations. Mm -hmm. We don't want to do that. Our intent is to be much more thoughtful about that and, and figure out ways that we can do it that it's beneficial. On the other side of that, um, it does generate aid for school districts, which is all, also can be a helpful thing. So that's why we've been engaged our business officials and our, our steering committees, and we just had a very detailed conversation in management steering that uh, uh, Superintendent Committee was in to talk about ways we can go about doing that and what really is the tolerance for districts. Um, because it is your capital, it is sure. your students, and we need to do what is going to be right by our districts when we do that. So, Jan, that's a great point. You know, and it makes perfect sense. It's just one of those things I never thought about. Sure. You know, it's like, oh. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. right. Yeah, because we are not a, as you know, we are not a, right. um, an entity that levies taxes, nor do we get state aid. Right. So it, it, mm -hmm. it comes from a very different mechanism. So we've tried to be thoughtful about it. And, um, you know, particularly for career and tech, keeping our shops to industry standard is really our stock and trade. We have to do that if we're going to be viable. That does require us to do some upgrading, as you would guess, mm -hmm. from time to time. Thanks. You bet. Anyone else? We're looking forward to the visit and Great. have a Google form that we're all going to participate in and come up with a date. Um, and I know Tom wants to be there as well. It so is. we are looking forward to scheduling we that We will make you. sure that we get that set, and certainly we'll have some collaboration back and forth on what exactly you want to see. You'll certainly want to see some of your students, but there may be some other aspects mm -hmm. as well. Thanks, Dan. Absolutely. So, folks, I, pre I appreciate the time. Enjoy the evening. Thanks. Thank you. Thank, yep. you. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. <clears throat> and... And next, the Board of Education invites the public to comment on matters regarding the school district. The public comment section of the meeting is a time for the Board of Education to listen. As a courtesy, we ask that you limit your comments to no more than three minutes. Comments naming specific personnel should be addressed privately or in writing to the Board in order to protect individuals' rights. And matters that would infringe upon student privacy will not be addressed in this public forum. With that being said, is there anyone <coughs> present who would like to address the Board? Hi. Hi. My name is Lori Miller, and I am the proud parent of two teenage daughters here in Webster. And I'm also honored to teach in the Webster School District, and I currently teach first grade at Clem South. So I just wanted to share a little bit of my experience um, on the Start Time Committee. I was um, fortunate to get to participate in that this past year and started. Um, First of all, the committee was run in such an organized, um, succinct way with such purposeful meetings. It was really a pleasure to be a part of that committee because the committee was the driving force of what we would go in each forthcoming meeting. Um, but there was so much legwork done and prepared um, regarding the things that we were interested in exploring. So thank you um, for all the organization. I know that Larry did a great job pulling that committee together. So um, just a review of my time on the start time committee. It began, and I know many of you were there right here, I believe, with Dr. Conley and an, another pediatrician speaking about um, the effects of sleep and lack of sleep on teenagers. And given that I'm, I was kind of like living this, it was really reaffirming to hear Dr. Conley say that Yes, despite all of your efforts to have a regular bedtime routine and limited screen time and doing all the parental things the best that I could, um, it, there were biological reasons why my children cannot get to sleep as early as I want to go to sleep. <laughs> so, um, so I thought that was a great kind of kickstart just looking at the medical science. And, and one of the biggest things that stood out to me was um, well, if we have the American Medical Association saying we should be starting school no earlier than 8.30, then how can we have a community program that forces us to ignore medical advice was kind of. So um, as I said, I, I live with teenagers, so I really do live the, the reality of that um, 
delayed melatonin release. Um, so, so that was um, a great connection to the life I'm living at home. I'm also, I work as a primary teacher, so my response here is my personal and anecdotal um, experience. And, and a lot of our um, discussions into the primary, how this change might affect the primary students was more anecdotal, not as scientific as the research we write about the teenagers. Um, but I certainly remember when the elementary schools were early and I really felt that it worked great and as primary teacher I'm always saying the kids are the best before lunch so the longer chunk I have before lunch the better I can um, do you know again I know some people would disagree but my personal experience as um, a parent and as a teacher is that the little ones seem to be up and ready to go um, and one thing that I know when my children were at State Road, and it was in early school, then got moved to late school, I really felt a loss for um, some of their childhood. It sounds kind of dramatic, but my kids used to be home at 2.35, and we'd play in the backyard, and we'd go to Strong Museum, and when my kids started not getting home till 4, then you think about little kids that you need to start preparing dinner by 5.00, um, I really felt the loss of that afternoon playtime for them when they were better running in the backyard and swinging versus being in the classroom was my personal experience and opinion. So I just wanted to share. Thanks, Lori. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for being here and sharing with us. Next, before we move into our um, liaison reports, we have Matt Mason Zakowski here um, earning his Boy Scout badge. Would you stand and say hello? Hi. Hi. <laughs> and tell us which um, Boy Scout troop you're with? 110, PAC 110, okay. Thank you very much for being here and I hope you enjoy it. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on to our student liaisons um, from Thomas and Schrader. Thank you. All four, please come up and have a seat. Thank you, ladies. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Want to go first, Amy? Uh, sure. Uh, good evening, everyone. I hope that you are all having a wonderful start to the new year and are all staying warm as it's supposed to get very cold this weekend. <laughs> so. um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of a um, serious issue. So um, as most of you probably know, the use of vapes and other e-cigarettes has become a huge problem, not just in Thomas, but in schools all around the U.S. In our building, we're, looking, we're working to expose our students to the true facts and real risks associated with the use of e-cigarettes, such as vapes or jewels. We want to make sure that all of our Thomas family is safe. And in, so, in efforts to do this, we're providing links to parents on the risks of vaping so that they have the resources to talk to their kids about it and make them aware. In addition to this, we're also making hotlines available for students to call to help them to quit. Jumping into the new year, we learned about some of our awesome and talented Titans and their achievements. Our geotech class has started to make above ground progress with the warm weather right after the holiday break. They are constructing a classroom gazebo for our main courtyard, which we hope to have done this spring in time for the warm weather. Thanks to Mr. Mangos, Mr. Tutrello, Mrs. Abby, and the entire Geotech crew for their hard work. Some of our students in our Titan Newspaper Club were recognized by the Empire State of School Publication Association for the school newspaper pieces they wrote last year. Specifically, Morgan Hardy and Katherine Hobbs received newspaper gold awards. Anna Perkerny and Brianna Youngquest received silver, Kelly Carson and Zachary Charlebois <coughs> received bronze, and Cheyenne Harris, Sarah, and Laura Postigo received honorable mention. We are so proud of all these talented writers. Another one of our students who was recognized for their great achievements was Sierra Trottier, who won the Hobie Award. Founded in 1958, the Hugh O'Brien Youth Leadership Organization, or HOBI, has had its mission to inspire and develop a global community of youth and volunteers to a life dedicated to leadership, service, and innovation. This year, Sierra was selected as Webster Thomas's HOBI delegate. 
She will attend the program this June at the University of Rochester. As the official delegate, she is able to attend the program at no cost through the generosity of the Women's Club of Webster. We are so thrilled for her and cannot wait to hear about all the things she learns this summer. Senator Pam Hemling today announced that Webster Thomas High School senior Liam Murphy has been nominated for the U.S. Presidential Scholars Program. Liam is one of the 25 high school senior, seniors from across New York State whom Commissioner Elia nominated for the program, a list that includes 10 male students and 10 female students, and five career and technical education students. The Presidential Scholar recognition is one of the nation's highest honors for high school students. Every year, one young man and one young woman from each state are na named as Presidential Scholars. Liam is considered to be near the top of his class, the class of 2019, of 350 students. He has taken the most rigorous academic programs offered, and he is on track to receive the highest diploma, a New York State Regents Diploma with advanced dis designation and honors, as well as the highest honor, summa cum laude. I cannot express enough how overjoyed we are have to such people, like all the ones I have just mentioned, a part of our Thomas family. Transitioning on to sports. On Wednesday, Thomas bowled against Canandaigua. The girls won all three games and the match, as did the boys. Our Titan wrestlers traveled to Canandaigua last weekend, winning the Bradshaw Tournament. Finishing second for his weight class was Cole Nadridge, and our other individual champions were CJ Lee and Cameron Cochiti. Unfortunately, due to the lack of snow, both our Nordic and Alpine ski teams have yet to have any competitions. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully, after this weekend, that will change. <laughs> Titan hockey players took on Spencerport last Saturday and beat the Rangers 10 to 2. Goals were scored by Kevin Gabowski with three, Tom Amon and Devin Mulcahy with two each, Zach Wolf, Spencer, Spencer Nuchetelli, Schrader, uh, and Jack St Steffenbeck with one each. The boys' basketball team played Schrader last night. We received a special treat as one of our Thomas Special Ed students rocked it singing the national anthem. The Titans tied mm -hmm. the game on a three-pointer by Andrew Mason with 30 seconds left, but Schrader managed to score the final basket with 1.3 seconds left on the clock. Moving on to girls basketball, like Tuesday night the girls traveled across town to take on the Warriors. They won 60-28 mm -hmm. to 28 and a great team effort. Top scorers included Ashley Schenkel with 17, Lindsey Kauf with 13, and Audrey Mack with 9. Speaking of our fantastic Titan basketball players, I want to congratulate two of our players, Andrew Mason and Taylor Lockwood. Both were recognized by the Democrat and Chronicle for their outstanding athletic abilities as their Athletes of the Week. In addition to this recognition, Lockwood was also named the More Than a Game Foundation Tournament MVP after the Titan won the championships. Awesome job, Titans. That's all from me, and I hope you all have a warm and safe evening. Were you the Hobie Baker or that representative last year for the leadership? No. Okay, I couldn't remember, but I, yeah. think, you, I think you received something about the leadership piece last that year. That was for uh, Best Buddies. Best Buddies, okay. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Grace. Thank you. Okay, so to start off, we're going to start with an award that was won by Anirudh Sharma. He was named a top 300 scholar in a 78th Regener and Science Talent Search. It's the nation's oldest and most prestigious science and mathematics competition for high school seniors. Um, out of almost 2,000 students entered in the competition, and Anirud was named one of the top 300. He will be receiving $2,000, and the school will also be receiving $2,000 to use towards STEM-related activities. He is also eligible to be named one of the 40 finalists who will receive $25,000 and are invited to Washington, D.C. for the final competition in March. Um, we also will be having a student council meeting next week, and we'll be starting to talk about our crush sales. And we'll also be teaming up with Triam this year to raise money for Galasano's children, Children's Hospital by selling conversation hearts. On Tuesday, January 15th, more than 30 students, administrators, and staff gathered in the Schrader Library for a celebration of Schrader's reading community. Um, the highlight of the event was a book talk by our Wendy co-authors, Emerson Orman, who's a Schrader freshman, and Kate Ryder, who's a seventh grader at Willink, who read from their book and shared with their audience their writing process. And they also credited their Webster teachers for giving them the freedom to write creatively, including Mrs. Ferentz from 
blank south. Um, and in regards to seniors, um, a lot of them are excited about getting their college accept acceptances and scholarship awards, so everybody's making that decision, you know, with second quarter closing, excited for graduation. With second quarter closing, there are a lot of final exams going on, like Mr. Brown's class for law and justice. Mm -hmm. The court cases have been going on. We saw Mr. Gamina there. Um, the court cases have been going on, so the students are super excited about that to finally demonstrate their six weeks of work. Um, the seniors are also uh, working tonight. There's going to be a final exam for Mrs. Ham's class for drama, so a lot of students are putting on their show tonight, so that's, they're super excited. That's cool. Thank you. Hi, um, okay, so in the last few weeks, students have been starting to select their courses for next year. Um, Mr. Fedor has gathered about 15 volunteers from his classes to have a lunch party in Mrs. Burgess's fifth block class. If it works out well, they're gonna start doing it more regularly and start kind of sort of make it like a weekly thing, I think. And oops, sorry. for athletics, Jack Willard was recognized as one of the 12 Democrat and Chronicles 2018 All Greater Rochester Award winners in boys section of volleyball. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, you so much guys. for being here. We appreciate it. I know. You're so great. And next, um, from WTA, we have Sue Bjarnar. Thank you, Sue, for being here. Is PTSA? PTSA is bad. No. Okay. I didn't hear from them. Hello. Hi, Sue. Hi. Hi. So I have highlights from across all of the buildings to share with you guys. Um, a little bit from everybody. Um, one of the first things is um, in the creative collaborations that we have. Um, there are second grade teachers from State Road and kindergarten teachers from Plank South. That's my building. Um, and we are studying purposeful play and how to use more play in primary classrooms. So um, the collaboration is meeting monthly to share ideas about play-based learning and are planning an upcoming peer learning walk to see how it's being implemented in our different classrooms. The teachers also were able to visit the Woodbury School at um, Strong Museum of Play and meet with teachers there about play-based learning. So that's continuing to go on. Um, Mr. Munson's first grade class at Plank South has created a kindness challenge bulletin board. Each student in the room came up with a different way to show kindness and posted outside their class with a secret number system. They've challenged the rest of the school to try to complete an act of kindness each day and track the ones they've done by their secret number. At State Road, second graders welcomed second graders from the um, Rochester City School District World of Inquiry School as a part of their social studies curriculum, learning about rural, urban, and suburban communities. After morning meetings, interactive activities, and recess together, the students discovered that urban and suburban students have more similarities than differences. Um, at Schrader, teacher Siobhan Julian was recently accepted to attend the 2019 Pogel National Meeting. Um, she spoke about that. Pogel is Process-Oriented Guided Inquiry Learning, and um, that will be in St. Louis this summer. It's an opportunity for her to participate on a national level to help shape the direction of Pogel. Approximately 60 educators, college professors included, are selected to attend each year. Come North band and orchestra teachers are preparing their fourth grade musicians for their first ever concert, which will be on January 24th at seven o'clock. At Plank North, the fifth grade classes have been busy reading and preparing to attend their Challenger space simulation field trip following intensive study and background work. And each class will be visiting um, very soon, near the end of January. Also at Plank North, fourth graders have been studying the genre of biography and tying in New York State history. After reading the biography of George Eastman, classes will be visiting the George Eastman House on a field trip next week thanks to their Cultural Arts Committee. Fourth graders at DeWitt have been studying animal defense mechanisms with millipedes and fiddler crabs. Students set up and care for habitats and learn how animals use their bodies and behaviors to protect themselves. They integrate that learning into writing informational paragraphs, and at the end of their unit, they will write a choose-your-own-adventure piece starring an animal with a defense mechanism, as well as an optional application essay to prove they can care for the crab or millipede, and if chosen, they get to keep the creature because they cannot be released into the wild. 
In addition to all the great learning going on in our schools, the WTA CARES Committee collected food from teachers at all buildings to donate to the Backpack Program and the Goal Program. And these were delivered in December before the break. And lastly, WTA has also created a polar plunge team for the Special Olympics. Brave souls, who do not include me, will participate on Sunday, February 10th. So that's all from us. Thank not you me. so much. <laughs> uh, Brian Neenan has, uh, has volunteered to be the, uh, the admin representative. So we're all excited. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sue. For the update and for the WT, uh, WTA CARES initiative this year as well. That was wonderful. Thanks again. Moving on to our instructional report, we have Terry McCarthy joining us tonight to Hi, update Terry. us. Good evening. Thank you. Good evening. So and actually, oh, yeah. actually, before Terry goes, and I think, Terry, I think I'm correct. Um, the last time, there's one big difference between the last time that Terry spoke to the board and tonight. And I'm not sure if you can tell just by looking at him. I got taller. But, um, <laughs> but Terry. You couldn't tell. You're sitting. Ter <laughs> Terry, Terry is now a doctor. He received his doctorate ah. from St. John Fisher um, in May. And so he is now Dr. McCarthy. Yeah. Thank you. Many congratulations, Thank you. Terry. Thank you. And thank you, and thank you for Carm for your support, uh, and Brian, and the whole district. It was a really, really an awesome experience, and be able to bring some of that learning back to the work. Uh, and so today, we want to talk about uh, humanities department, with a particular focus on English as a new language program, and um, what are some of the initiatives we are undertaking around diversity. And so. In terms of the work that, that, that I spend most of my time around, uh, I focus on social studies, the world languages, which you might have heard of as LOAT in the past, languages other than English. Um, the state is now transitioning to a more inclusive world languages. And um, also English is a new language, and we'll talk about some of those, the new terms around ENL um, in a moment. And just a, a, a couple of quick updates while we'll focus on ENL and diversity. Um, for social studies, there's a new Regents exam for Global that will be coming online uh, actually this June, though in, in Webster we decided to delay a year. We had that option. Um, we wanted to have a chance to look at the test, and uh, when we uh, talked to our teachers, the consensus was to wait a year uh, for the new exam. And then a United States history and government exam um, is in the works, a new re redesigned one to align with the new social studies framework. That will be 2021, potentially 2022. Um, so that's coming up. You'll hear more from me probably in the future about that. And then as far as world languages go, the standards have not been updated since 1996. Uh, and so the world has changed a lot in uh, almost 25 years. <laughs> and so there's a, a work, work underway. I was just at a regional leadership meeting around world language, and so we'll be hearing some things from state ed uh, in the next little while to update the standards and then potentially reintroduce state tests uh, for um, benchmark exams for middle and high school uh, world language, right? So, and then one other thing, uh, just a, 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 re a reminder if you were able to see it or you've ever been there, the uh, Schrader 10th graders, uh, close to 370 10th graders on Friday participated in the Model UN Day. And um, what an incredible celebration. Hard, hard work. Um, the teachers and students together accomplished incredible things. Uh, most of the students before said I could never do this and afterwards said, what was I worried about? Uh, they were so prepared, and um, it was just a, a great experience. And there's a picture of the teachers at the bottom. So a special shout out to the Schrader 10th uh, grade social studies teachers uh, for all their hard work, and of course the 370 uh, warriors who participated last week. Really an incredible accomplishment. And so when we think about ENL, and we'll focus primarily on that to start, um, I was just trying to wrap my head around uh, what, what this means for us and when we think about diversity, what that means. And I, I started thinking about the one Webster and then uh, as the social studies guy in me um, thought about e pluribus unum. And I think about what does that mean? What does that mean to our country and, and more specifically, how does that relate to one Webster? 
And when we think about the 9,000 students that, that walk through our halls on a day-to-day -day basis, they are many. And so how of that many do we create the one? How do we actualize our district motto? So it's not just something we put up on the wall uh, so that every kid feels that they're part of the one. And we're gonna focus on, on a group of students today who historically, in a variety of systems, not just our own, uh, maybe haven't felt part of one. And so really talking about what is our work that we've been doing and then what is some work that we have to do moving forward to create that one Webster. And before we move forward, we wanna talk a little alphabet soup for you all. Um, you'll hear a couple of different acronyms kicked around and just to clarify, um, ENL uh, is English as a New Language. That's the name of the program. So you may hear it and, and, and I may even slip up. Um, it historically has been called ESL or ESL. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, ENL is more uh, indicative of our students. Not all of our students are second language learners. Many of them are third and fourth language. So English is new to them, not necessarily just their second language. Uh, ESL, those are the teachers, um, and they teach English as a second language, uh, and that hasn't changed in part because their certifications um, say ESL, or you might see ESOL, um, English to speakers of other languages. And then ELL are, or L's are the English language learners. Those are the students that we serve. So just a couple of acronyms that, that you might hear or we'll use tonight um, just to give you a little bit of background on that. And before we move forward, oh yeah, that's what I want to do. Before we move forward, um, normally at the end you all have, will have questions for me and I'm sure you will today, um, but today I get to ask you all a couple of questions, if that's okay. <laughs> A little quiz, and you don't have to share your answers. It's not being graded. Um, so the first question, if you want to just jot something down or think in your head, um, how many students are served in, Web in the Webster ENL program? More than we think. Yeah. And I purposely did not include this information in the in the packet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, what percentage of our students were born in the United States that are L's, that are English language learners? How many different countries are represented in our classrooms? How many different languages are represented? And then finally, what are our top three languages, other than English, that our uh, English language learners bring to school with them? All right, so now I, I will say we haven't talked a lot about our ENL program here at Webster, and, and certainly uh, my work uh, with the department of the last five years. And so it's exciting to share this information uh, in a public forum. So our first question, how many students? We have 209. ENL students in the district. Um, and just to put it into perspective, um, in uh, a year ago at this time, we were at 162. Uh, the year before that, we were at 179. Um, that, this uh, 209 is from January 15th. Uh, and the reason is that number changes. Um, it's, it is a population that, that tends to be transient. In particular, they're um, oftentimes, uh, a, a number of our families uh, economically are moving from place to place, not all of them by any stretch. Um, but usually, at least once or twice a week, we have students who come into our school who we have to screen to see if they uh, are eligible for ENL services. And you see the breakdown by school. Um, one of the things I do want to mention, you'll see a new school on there, uh, Willink. We're very excited as a school community to welcome the ENL program to Willink for the first time. Uh, one of the things, uh, as uh, Carm and I have talked, as we think about this community, um, our students who were ENL students have, prior to this year, 
uh, starting in sixth grade, had to go to Spry or Schrader, regardless of where they lived, for their secondary school. And so we've made a concerted effort, and we're going to add one grade level a year. Um, so next year we'll have sixth and seventh at Willink, um, and then eventually we will have um, students through the Thomas Willink Thomas catchment um, all the way if they need ENL services. Um, so that's a really big. Uh, add and we're very excited to that we were able to do that within existing staff um, because we had grown over the number of years anticipating some of the changes uh, and really the growth of our population and we've grown close to close to 25 percent over the last uh, three years uh, and and we don't anticipate that that number is going to change all right so our uh, countries of origin um, what percent of our students were born in the US? Uh, a little over 50%. So 51 approximately were, are, are born in the United States, are citizens of the United States born here. Um, and then our other two largest countries are the Ukraine and uh, India. Um, we've, we've had a large uh, South Asian population, uh, or larger, um, in part because of Xerox. Uh, Xerox has been hiring a number of contract workers uh, in the num past number of years. It will be interesting to see. We've seen a few cuts. The impact on that is families leaving, our South Asian families. Um, so those are, uh, we have, uh, in total, we have uh, 21 different students from 21 different countries represented in our, in our classrooms, which is incredible, so exciting. And then how many languages? We have 38 different languages that our students bring to them with us on a day-to-day -day basis, which is, I mean, it's, it, it's the United Nations in Webster, which is very exciting. Um, and, and now, understand they're not all fluent. They don't all read or write maybe in their home language, um, but they're hearing it. Um, it might be a heritage language. Their parents are speaking it um, or, or engaging in it or that they've lived there, lived with that language their whole life. And, and while the diversity of these languages and these experiences could potentially present some challenges, certainly in an academic setting, where we've really tried to shift the focus is this is not a barrier. This is an opportunity. We think about what, what our students bring with them, the vast world experience that they bring, the incredible opportunities that they can share with their friends. The other piece that we know is that students who are bilingual, multilingual, are able to be much more successful in all their academic areas. And so it's not about um, impeding their ability or their interest in their home language. It's about supporting their home language and then encouraging that academic support in English. And we encourage our families to embrace their various backgrounds and, and speak with their kids their, uh, their heritage languages because we know how important that is. So out of that one, the many, the 38 different languages, the 21 different countries is where they come. Now, part of the impetus for our change in our program has been some changes to the New York State regulations around um, English as a new language, the Part 154, which you may have heard some changes about. And the biggest shift to that is where and how we provide instruction for our English language learners. Predominantly, in the past, most of that instruction was done in a pull-out section. We're going to pull you out. You're going to be separate from your, from your peers. And just like what we've seen with special education, the importance of integrating, integrated co-teach. And so the, the state has required for the vast majority of our English language learners that the, their experience with English is an integrated experience with both an English as a new, or English as, as a second language teacher and a classroom or ELA teacher. So that has provided incredible opportunities for our kids. It's also meant that we have needed some professional learning. And so we have invested, and thank you uh, to Brian and Brian and, and Carm for supporting this. We've brought in three nationally renowned speakers um, who, have, who are experts in uh, ELL instruction. And in particular, two that were experts in co-teaching. We've partnered with the Arburn, which is our regional network, which is uh, an arm of New York uh, the State Education Department. We've done extensive collaboration with them uh, to provide professional learning. And we've also collaborated with in internally, uh, in particular leveraging our teacher teach teacher and our flip professional learning opportunities. We've also uh, created collaborations with the special service or student services department because 
one of the things we, we have to really tease through is when a student struggles to acquire English, is it because of their, their difference, their culture? Are there things within their home or heritage language that might be impediments? Are there cultural pieces that we don't see? Or is it truly, you know, there's a, there's a disability that's, that's barring. And so we're really trying to work through that to be thoughtful and, and, and understanding as our, care, as our students present certain academic challenges. We also have, have grown the program and really have, have looked to create um, community op opportunities. And one of the things we've expanded our summer program, uh, we take students throughout uh, Webster, we've uh, created a partnership with our town library, we've partnered with some of our uh, local uh, apartment complexes and, and communities to create more uh, opportunities for our students. So we're excited about that. We know we have a long way to go. Um, but we're excited about that. And, and speaking of having a long way to go, I want to segue to our work around diversity and, and broadly speaking. So we've zoomed in on a specific population, our English language learners, but I think it's important that we zoom out and we think about that one and that many and, and, and that we have a, a, a percentage of our population of students who may or may not feel that they are part of that one. And so in talking with CARM um, this summer, and, and really thinking about this, how do we, how do we help ensure that all of our students, regardless of their skin color or their race or their religion, whether they wear a hijab, um, where and how they pray, um, who they're friends with, that they feel like they are part of that one. And so there, these are just a couple of things. Now, so many of our classroom teachers are doing that. They're building community. This is not to suggest that we isn't already happening. It's just we're not doing it as a system. And so we're really looking this year to take a systematic approach to start to, to have a, what does that one Webster mean for us? And so one of the things that we've undertaken is to create the Seal of Biliteracy opportunity. This is a special graduation award, which is given to, to seniors who have demonstrated proficiency both in English and a home language. And so what we really want to do, it's not just for our English language learners, um, it is for students who are you who potentially we have a, a large Ukrainian population who go to Ukrainian school on a Saturday um, But they've lived in the United States their whole lives. They speak English really as their home language Recognizing that it's also for our students who study world language our Spanish students um, German French whatever it might be so a way to say you know what speaking another language is not a, An add-on a special nice little thing. It's critical and let's celebrate it this year we have 36 teacher uh, students and 20 teacher mentors who are who are using their time to help out our students and i would be remiss to, if i didn't recognize leslie hall who is the lead teacher at schrader uh, for uh, for world languages she has been a driving force behind this and and we wouldn't be as far as we were if it's not for uh the work of leslie and rather than me telling you about it I figured we'd have our students talk a little bit about what the seal of biliteracy means. Ni hao. Jambo. Guten tag. Salam alaikum. Welcome. Hola. Bonjour. Chesh. Sasrigal. Konnichiwa. Did you know that many of the students in our school can speak more than two languages at home? Are you literate in more than one? Then the seal of biliteracy is for you. So this includes students who have studied world languages here in the Webster School District, and also students who, have, who speak a different language other than English in, in their homes with their families. The Seal of Biliteracy is a statement by a district that mastery of two or more languages is very important. We offer the Seal of Biliteracy for the following reasons. To honor the multiple cultures and languages in our community, and to encourage students to study another language to prepare students with 21st century skills and to be college and career ready. Our students want to pursue the seal of biliteracy because... Yo quiero vivir, estudiar y trabajar en otros lugares. Je voudrais explorer la beauté des autres cultures. Je voudrais voyager. Quiero distinguirme entre los miles de solicitantes para la universidad. Quiero ser bilingüe. So that's just a, a, a brief overview. They have to uh, 
do tests, they have to do uh, presentations on top of their regular schoolwork. And so we have 36 students, we're actually potentially adding more. So it's really an exciting um, move for our, our, our district and for our community. And I wanna just show you like 10 seconds. This is a student, David Alexander, who's a Schrader senior in AP Spanish with Mrs. Hall. And uh, this is going to be submitted for part of his project. He has been studying Spanish in Webster just for six years. He's never traveled uh, to, a, to a Spanish country where he's had to use the Spanish language. And I just want you to think about that as you listen to David. Hola amigos, ¿qué tal? Cuéntame, ¿cómo dan las cosas? Para mí, mi vida es perfecta. La semana pasada yo fui a Colombia para una vacación y para aprender más información sobre la cultura colombiana. Y ahora yo tengo mucho para compartir. Y después de viajar, me di cuenta que es necesario que todas las personas vayan a Colombia por cuatro razones. All right, so um, the, the project was um, why do you want, why Colombia, or why and, and pick a country? Um, and David is not using cue cards. That is just, he prepared obviously, but that's off the top of his head. Um, that's what our kids can achieve. And, and we have so many, and we're so excited for this honor for our students. And congratulations so far to David and, and for taking this step on. The other thing that we've been doing, uh, particular at starting a trader is uh, Schrader started a dream club um, Alex Peck Catherine Pasmino uh, and then working now this year with Alex uh, Isaac Collins the assistant principal at Schrader and that dream club diversity club took 12 students to the rock to change summit uh, on race relations and the rock to change is a 600 students from around uh, this region rural, urban, suburban, talking about matters related to race. And, and basically teenagers saying, you know what, adults, maybe you're not gonna figure it out, but we're going to. And this is where we're gonna start. And out of that, our, our students came away saying, we've gotta do something with our, our work here at Schrader. And I just wanna show you a few second clip from Mahan. Mahan stood up at the end, it was past the mic. And this is um, Mahana Bas from Schrader talking about her experience at Rock to Change. I came to it like two years ago. And now seeing it so like people's ideas change and just talking to other people that feel the same way as I do and want to make a change as much as I do, it kind of really like, it made me proud. And so Mahan is, 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 a, is a student who has an activist mindset and wants to make a change. And, and as part of that change, uh, Webster Schrader students from the Dream Club will be hosting our, our first ever student panel focused on diversity and equity. And, and we have five brave Schrader warriors who are going to uh, sit in front of a group of adults and talk about their experience. What does it mean to, to, to be a student of color at Webster Schrader, um, to wear a hijab? Uh, to 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 celebrate Ramadan, um, what does that what does that look like um, to to be African American in Webster, and and to, to really help our teachers understand that experience um, from the students' voices. And this was the kids saying, you know what, we've got to do this. We are so excited. We want to make a change. And and I think all of us as adults know when you, we sort of let our kids go and we get out of their way, the amazing things that they can accomplish. And and so. If you are available on the 22nd at three o'clock, we'll be in the Schrader Orchestra Room. If you can make it, that would be fantastic. Um, certainly we understand everybody's schedules are busy, but um, I think it's gonna be a very exciting opportunity. The other piece we want to just quickly mention is that while we recognize certainly our students, our families um, come from vast culturally different backgrounds and uh, linguistically different backgrounds. And so two important things I'd like to just talk about at our big steps towards our systematic diversity initiative is our first ever district-wide English as a New Language parent program. So we'll be hosting right here on January 31st uh, a meeting specifically for our ENL parents. Uh, we currently have uh, eight translators who, will, who will, we've ar arranged to be there for us. We've sent out translated letters to all, or we're going to, we're in the process of our families. 
And we're going to talk in particular around start time. One of the, the groups of families, our ENL teachers were very, ESL teachers were concerned about, is our, our ENL families maybe weren't aware uh, or because our information was all in English. And, and so we really have to think about that. And Larry and I share an office. So um, unfortunately for Larry, he got roped into this. Um, but it, I, I'm just joking. Obviously, Larry wants to be part of this and, and get this information out to our families. So we're really excited about that. The other exciting opportunity is another partnership with a local agency, which is the Empire Justice Center, and starting a new group called um, the, the Families of Color. And this group, similar to some started in Rush and, and Brighton and Hilton, and it will be a, a, a group of, of families and their allies um, who are traditionally maybe marginalized and not specifically by our system, but maybe have felt marginalized or felt on the outside, be, didn't see themselves as part of the one. And so we're meeting purposely at the town library, at center of the town. They've got a great, got a great space and we're hoping to also be able to provide some child care. Um, so that is not gonna be a worry for our uh, families. And so with all that, lots going on and lots to look forward to. I'll just leave you with this from Marion Wright Edelman, who started the, Ch the Children's Defense Fund. Education is for improving the lives of others and for learning your community and world, leaving your community and world better than you found it. And with that, I will turn it over to questions. Thank you so much. Thanks, Terry. Thank you. <laughs> Jen? At what level would our student who like like the young man who's who had six years yeah. of of Spanish. What level would our students have to be in a in a language that they've taken in school versus a language that they learned at home to get a biliteracy award? Yeah, it's the same criteria. Is it? Yep. So they will use the same rubric, and then um, we'll have language specific interpreters uh, or graders. So we're gonna we're gonna rely on the community to serve on that panel when they do their presentations. Oh, okay. Yes, I, I just have a quick sure. question. Sure. Um, so you talked about previously students had to go to Spry and Schrader, yes. and now you're opening up Willink. So that's the the um, preference for homeschool. Yeah. That's, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And so for elementary, you're. Is that the goal as well in elementary to for students to go to their home school? Well, we haven't gone to that spot yet. Okay. I, I think we really want to at least have it at the secondary catchment level, and, and then we'll see so as, a, it, as a program. Right. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So at least they're not traveling on opposite sides of the town. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes sense. Thank you. Linda. Do you have anything? Questions, okay. but thank you. Thank you so it was much. Awesome. I'm very excited about the seal of bioliteracy. Yeah. Actually, my daughter is is doing it right now. So, oh. I, I didn't know she was as fluent in Spanish until she started talking to us this year. Amazing. So, <laughs> it's exciting. Yes. Yeah, so, thank you. Yeah, diversity is one of our main topics for the Monroe County School Board Association, and you were talking about collaboration. And I wish I could remember the school in the city of Rochester that deals with um, foreign students. Do you remember Tammy? Uh, I remember the principal. Yeah. Um, but it Rochester is, International Academy. Yes. Yes. It, it yes. is definitely yes. someone that we should collaborate with. And recently, uh, MCSBA heard a speaker <clears throat> from uh, Brockport who was mm -hmm. just fantastic. And I think he'd, he, I, I know my conversations with him, he's, he'd be willing to come and talk. Great. Um, yeah. I also want to thank you for being part of the Board of Directors for Rock to Change, because yeah. I think it's a very, very important thing, and I'm glad that we've got Schrader involved, and I hope we can get Thomas involved with that yep. also. Yep, Mr. Weedor has, has, uh, has said that we're, we're working spring. on making sure in the spring there'll be a, a second um, <coughs> summit in March, and so there'll be representation from Schrader. I, I know they have it planned out for a couple of years, but I would really yeah. hope Webster could host one time. Yeah, and, and so um, there's now funding to keep it at the convention center. But, but to host as the whole school district yep. to be able to organize, yes, I am, yep. I'm with you on that, Mike. We'd yep. like to go there for sure. Well, thank you for the report. Yeah, thank you. It was excellent. Thank you, Dr. McCarthy. Thank you so much. <laughs> and may we have a motion to accept the report as presented? Sue and Jan, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Thank you so much for thank all you, this yes. good work. I appreciate it.
Mm. Thanks, Tara. And next on our agenda, um, new superintendent's report. Sorry. The new superintendent's Car report? <laughs> wow. <laughs> it doesn't even refer to you. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Thanks. It's a new year. <laughs> Thanks, Sam. Um, I'm excited to begin my report tonight with some news from WonderCare. That's the district's new before and after school program that will begin in September of 2019. And we're hoping that the establishment of this program will help ease the transition for families in the district as we prepare to shift to an earlier elementary school start time um, and a later middle and high school start time in September. We welcome our new WonderCare directors Aaron Burns and Kristen Fenton, who, who will be creating an outstanding part-time, full-time, or drop-in program for Webster School District elementary and sixth grade families. And all elements of the program will support our district's curriculum and provide even more worthwhile educational experiences for our children. Um, if you'd like to learn more, Aaron and Kristen will be holding several information nights for parents only in February and March. Families will get to attend separate meet and greet nights later in the summer. Um, you see the parent information nights uh, and dates, locations, and times up on your screen. You can also learn more by visiting the WonderCare webpage on our website. Um, go to WebsterSchools.org. Um, and be sure to like and share WonderCare's new Facebook page um, at WonderCareWCSD. Next, I'd like to share news about an important national speaker our district will be hosting next month. Steve Garten is the National Manager for Common Sense Media and will be speaking to our district on Tuesday, February 5th, from 6.30 to 7.30 um, at night at the Willink Middle School. I encourage all families to attend and to hear Mr. Garten's message about the impact that media and technology is having on our kids. He will also share resources that all of our parents can use to help better understand our kids' media and technology use and guide us all through the ways um, uh, to, let's see, and to, and to help us sort of guide our ways through, through those uses. Um, I hope to see many of our One Webster families at this event that promises to be both powerful and informative. And that ends my report. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. And now on to new business. Um, Brian, if you'd like to sure. jump uh, in. The first item up is a transportation contract for the board to approve. Uh, this is a transportation contract with Ontario Bus in Incorporated. Uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, right before the holiday break, uh, the district uh, had a student that needed specialized transportation to a private placement outside of the district. Uh, one of the things we've been working on is trying to bring back some of these runs uh, and have district employees done, uh, doing this uh, through transportation because uh, we've historically outsourced these to Monroe One BOCES. Uh, but we actually have gotten to a point where we were a little strapped for drivers, so we uh, asked Monroe One if they would be able to take this run on for us under our current contract. They are also in the same position. So they could not. So we went out to a lot of the private contractors and uh, asked who, uh, who had space available. And Ontario Bus uh, came back and said they would be more than willing to take this route on for us. Uh, so we're, we kind of expedited that before board approval, a little bit of the cart before the horse. Uh, but we had to uh, because the, kid, the student needed to start their program on January 2nd when school returned in session. Mm -hmm. uh, so formally, uh, board adopting the contract tonight, and we will send this off to state ed for their approval tomorrow morning. Uh, but you know, it goes to speak to uh, right now. I think the position that many districts and many of these companies are in with with bus driver shortages uh, on some of these more specialized runs. So normally, we we hope to not do this, but it was such a unique case where we we needed to outsource this run. Do it in house. Generally, yes. Generally, but mm -hmm. if you have a shortage, we were, we, we're, yeah, we're, yeah, we were, we're strapped, so we have no choice. Really. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was. They caused it. It was just at a tough time when we we have several runs that had 
already been filled and we were at our capacity oh, okay. and we would have to chop a lot of things up and it would just be easier to um, outsource this one. Okay. okay, can we have a motion to accept the transportation contract with Ontario Bus? So moved. Mike and second by Linda, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, that's unanimous. And on to the BOCES lease approval. So the BOCES lease approval, uh, this is, it seems like just yesterday we were going down this, ru uh, this road and um, now is time for renewal of our, all of our devices this summer uh, for all the students. Three years has passed with all the Chromebooks and the iPads and K-1-2. Uh, so this is to begin that process begin the ordering to prep for summer for the refresh of all those devices. So that is, uh, as we know, we partner with BOCES, we lease the equipment mm -hmm. for them, maximizing our, our state aid uh, for that purchase. And uh, I do this every year on a continuous cycle with all of our, our lease equipment. But this is, the, this is the big one. This is every student device uh, is included in this one every three years. Any questions, anyone? Can we have a motion to approve the BOCES lease approval? So moved. By Jan. Second. Second by Sue, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, motion carries. On to the bond resolution and estoppel notice, which is a roll call vote. Um, Brian, if you'd like to speak sure. to that, yep. please. Sure, yep, we need a roll call vote. This is, I can't, this is our first official meeting post capital project vote in December. Uh, right. So we always do this right afterwards. And this is the uh, legal authority for the district to now, uh, when the time is right, to borrow the necessary funds to complete the construction project. It's very exciting. Okay, can we have a motion please so to moved. accept the bond resolution? So moved. In a second. All in favor? I like that roll call. Oh. Roll and call. are you calling? Yes. Yep. Mike? Cindy? Yes. Linda? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Sue? Yes. Jan? Yes. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. On to the treasurer's report for October and November. Uh, a couple things I'd like to point out uh, for October. You see uh, tax money uh, coming into the district, uh, but also very importantly with October, you see uh, due from other funds. Uh, those first couple months, we start spending grant money uh, before the money actually comes in, so our federal fund. So our general fund uh, loans the money to the grants until that money comes through. So you see a very large number there. What is this $3.5 million due from other funds? That's just the grants owing us money uh, to start the school year. Um, and I will ask you to, uh, to pay close attention on these treasury reports, the interest rates, because you will see a massive change when the February treasurer's report comes. Uh, we are significantly moving around some of our accounts uh, to garner better rates that are gonna be well above where they are right now. And some okay. rates are going we'll up. Excellent, it's nice okay. that we're finally one gonna... Five. We'll be in the one five to two two range. Mm -hmm. Same providers? Uh, three out of the four, yes. Any other questions? Can we have a motion, please, to accept the treasurer's report for October and November? So moved. Linda, second by Mike. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion carries. And on to the Webster Center lease agreement. So unfortunately, we have to move, <laughs> <laughs> in short. Uh, so the Spry project, we just opened bids today. Uh, so you'll get to hear all about those at the next board meeting uh, when we present who's the lowest bidder. Uh, but one of the things that the construction team was, was looking at is with the massive amount of construction that's going to be ha happening on the south side, which is really the main entrance for Spry for parents on 250 for morning and afternoon drop off, that's gonna create some traffic problems. Uh, so one of the uh, recommendations was is to utilize the Sanford side a little bit more. Uh, and with that would be uh, relocating about the 100 or so employees that come in and out every single day on that side uh, to, to loosen up the, the traffic congestion. So in an effort to kind of make part of the Spry pro, uh, construction more efficient, 
rather than having to you know shut down and open up every time and keep that side open you just close it down don't have to move the uh, capital equipment while the uh, cafetorium is being constructed and if we vacate that frees up the Sanford side a little bit more for traffic um, and allows that free flow so that was one of the ideas that was floated it made made sense the construction team agreed so we began the process of finding us a temporary home uh, in the community and saw many sites uh, uh, Mr. Neenan, uh, Mr. Gamina, uh, several others came along looking at different spots uh, that had open office space and the Webster Town Center uh, had the best price but also one of um, the best locations with easy access because uh, we were trying to be mindful of who's coming to visit us, parents for meetings, parents for registrations, um, employees with questions for uh, HR or business, retirees coming to pay health care. So we wanted something that was still fairly accessible uh, to community members, residents, and retirees. Not something where you had to wind through a complex mm -hmm. and find the building and park. So this, this created that scenario perfectly for us um, with good signage and, and easy walkability to the, to the spots. This is the old Peaches place. Right? It is the old Peaches, uh, which Paychex has vacated. Um, it's the old Peaches, and they also had another spot on that first floor, too, that we were taking. Mm -hmm. I was trying to figure that out because it's listed as two separate square feet. It is two separate. Yeah. And, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it's the, the other yep. to the left of it and then where Peaches was. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Can I see February 1? Date? So we're uh, looking to begin that process in February. Yeah. And to be moved in by? The end of the month. Okay. And how will we notify people that we have moved? Our website, uh, we'll do a communication. Um, we also have a yeah. winter, uh, we have a new our next newsletter goes out March 1st. Oh. So, mm -hmm. I mean, we've already been, right. well, we'll be in the process, I guess. We, we care. There will be specific conversations for um, okay. for things that have already been kind of scheduled. And we can make it and known we'll to leave our... one person upstairs, mm -hmm. just to, you know, in case someone comes upstairs, they'll leave one person <laughs> on the side. Well, we, we, Covered we, in we, caution tape. Covered. <laughs> we, we can tell our PTSA representatives that, you know, we're moving and et cetera. Which we did last, mm -hmm. last okay. yeah, we did. Yeah. Some things will still be able to happen right. on the third floor because there won't be construction right away. We're simply moving to avoid everybody falling all over right. each right. other. So we, we still can come up and, and use a conference it, room. Or is your office going to stay up there? Or? No, I'm moving. You're yep, moving? I'll be one of the first ones to move. Cindy and I. Okay. So our board, where are our board meetings? Our board meetings here? will be here until the end of the year. And then beginning next, beginning most likely in the summer, we will most likely be at the Schrader Library. And, and yeah. we will travel. We'll go from that could be fun. We talked about doing that. <laughs> yeah. no, Maybe not, not for I'm sending that Paul. I'm sending Paul to the You just got the look. <laughs> so, Brian, is there a lot to do in terms of the infrastructure and wiring and for computers and Wi-Fi. That was one of the uh, things that made this advantageous because Paychex had it yeah. utilized for office space already. Oh, and right. it so it wasn't, wasn't it's restaurant. not a difficult <laughs> lift for us to uh, pull wiring, cabling, and to use our badge access system. And I, it was already there and set up. We just got to kind of Wonderful. take it the next step and finish it off. Okay, any other questions? Okay, I'm sure there will be. Um, can we have a motion to approve the Webster Town Center lease agreement? Mike, so moved. I'll second. Mike and second by Sue. And all in favor? Aye. 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 Unanimous. Motion carries. And we're back to the first reading of the policy 5040 attendance zones. Yes, we, um, this policy was part of our general review process. And um, we had, um, we're looking at the dates that are listed on, in the policy and just wanted to clarify it, make sure it's, it's easier to understand. Um, Dave Metzger and Jan are on the committee. 
um, Dave was proposing at the bottom that we change the, um, the dates to read any student that moves before January 1st must move to their new attendance zone and any student who moves after December 31st will be allowed to complete the year at the school that they originally started. Um, another proposal could be any student, if you look at the um, original read up in the top, any student that moves on or before December 31st must move to the new attendance zone and then any student who moves on or after. So you could do either one. Do you have a, a preference? Yeah. I don't really. I, I think probably just because I went through the discussion with it, I probably would um, prefer the, the last one you just okay. read. But um, and then also, I, in, in reading it, I was thinking we have the rule second. We want to have the rule first, first. and have the exceptions second. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking of um, where it starts, any student that moves. So this, the, the, um, the sentence that we're talking about, we want that one to be first, whatever we decide it's going to be, mm -hmm. to be first and be its own bullet. And then the um, two more bullets with if during the school year and then if after the start of the school mm -hmm. semester. So there'd be three bullets with the first one being the rule and the two after that being the exception. And that'd be clearer, I think. Yeah. And I, yeah. Um, so, clar you clarification, so. If I read this, if agreed by the principal and district administrator, so it's possible that the district administrator and principal could say, you're moving before December 31st, you will stay or move. Yeah. There's programmatic reasons why the... Yes. Does, does this imply that there is a date and... I'm not saying this right. Mm -hmm. now I know There's a saying. general rule, but exceptions will be considered. Right, and does this continue that, that exceptions? I mean, it's the yes. principle. Yes, everything, okay. yeah, it was just clarifying the dates to make sure that all the dates were covered. All right. So we're not changing the intent of the because policy Because somebody could all. stay even. Yes. Before. All right, I just want to make sure that's. No, just making it clear. It was, okay. it was very vague before it used break Yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. in the wording. So we were just trying to clean that up a little bit. Okay. Right. So um, I think we should table this and have it rewritten and do the first read at the next. Mm -hmm. um, so you're okay with either of the languages for, mm -hmm. for the dates? Okay. Um, we can talk about that offline, and then we'll bring it back for first Whatever reading. Whatever dates you use, whether it's the bottom red or yeah. the upper red, the honor after yeah. or honor before is really good. That phrase to really be sure to uh, fine tune the, the actual date. That's a good thing to have. Okay. So. All right. Okay. Maybe Cindy. So if you could type that up and maybe send it back to the committee, <coughs> and we'll. Sure. Okay. That would be great. And then we'll do our first read at our next regular board February meeting. February seventh is, is that our, our next, next regular okay. policy meeting. So then. Oh right. Or would we would we do it online and then do it at our next board meeting? And as our board meeting is that night, is that correct or is that a workshop? Which date? It's a workshop, I believe. February 7th is a meeting. February 14th is a workshop. Right. So, um, okay. I think we should bring it, try to bring it for a first read at the February 7th. At the February 7th because okay. we can just do, yeah. you know, pick our preference yeah. over email and then vote officially yes. with the whole board. Okay. Good. Okay. Great. And then the second one is, um, okay, let me second get my computer, read. is the second read. The health and dental yes. insurance. Mm -hmm. So there was no comments on the first read. Does anybody have any comments for the second? I'm assuming no. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then we just need a motion. So can we have a motion to accept the second reading of policy 4095 health and dental insurance for board members, please? So moved. By Mike. In a second. Second by Linda. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. And Jan. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to school liaison reports. Um, we want to 
go around. I have a report for, uh, from Maria for Duet okay. that I'll share. Do you want me to start? Sure. All right, I went to the January 7th Club North PTSA meeting and uh, the first discussion was about their holiday concert, which was the first time they have ever moved off campus. They were at Willink and um, things went very well. They, were, they took some informal surveys after parents and students were thrilled with it, mainly because of the jumbotrons. They could see their kids so clearly. Um, but I am thrilled from a personal reason. I have, for years, when I've been involved, been so nervous about all those people walking on Clem Road. Um, parking, they get a huge attendance. There's not enough parking. We've run buses from Clem South, but people park up and down Clem Road for a mile, without exaggerating. Um, so parking was wonderful over there. The parents loved it, the kids loved it. I know it was uh, a lot for the music teachers to move all that stuff or whatever, but I, I think they're so happy with it that maybe it will continue. Certainly not for their beginning band, which is uh, coming up. Beginner's band is January 24th, and that's gonna be at Clem North, but maybe for additional big concerts. So that was good news, and PTSA seemed very happy with that too. Um, and speaking of moving off campus, <laughs> the PTSA family dance will be held at Schrader, February 1. So again, they get a huge turnout for these events and the parking becomes a major issue. I remember being at Clum North one time when people had parked on the yard on the grass and got stuck in mud and having to call tow trucks. So um, this is good. <laughs> uh, the winter carnival is March 29th. Um, there was a traffic pattern that's been worked out and everybody seems much happier with that. So that's, that's great too. The morning show has gone live. People are thrilled with that. Um, after school clubs registration started last week and um, next meeting is February 11th. I guess that sort of sums it up. <laughs> okay, for Schlegel, um, they had a PTSA meeting on Tuesday evening, or I should say late afternoon, and um, it was fairly well attended and it's a good, good discussion, shared a, a lot of information. Specifically, tomorrow night is literacy night from 5.30 to 7.30 at Schlegel Road School, a fun night for everybody. and. They had a surprise literacy assembly on Monday, January 7th, and the students were all read a, a story, and every classroom was delivered a box of books. And the goal in the school is to have a thousand books for every classroom. Wow. That was, a, that was pretty astounding, but it's, they're really into literacy and want all the, all the students there to just love reading and, and have access to books readily. So that's my report. That's great. <laughs> Thank you. So on behalf of Maria, I will share for Duet, during the months of November and December, they celebrated World Kindness Day on November 13th, emphasizing for all to be role models of kindness, compassion, and empathy each day. They express their gratitude to their bus drivers by holding a celebration. And they do this a couple times throughout the year, and it's so well received and so much appreciated. Um, they sponsored DeWitt Gives Back Night, where families collected non-perishable food items, put together care packages for Rochester communities homeless, made ornaments, placemats, and dog toys for local families in need, decorated a giving tree to support Rochester's crisis nursery, and enjoyed pizza. They also hosted the holiday shop so students could purchase gifts for their families. They held an annual hat and mitten drive, um, and students created posters that they hung throughout the building. They performed a winter concert in the Thomas High School Auditorium, and DeWitt Road third graders were recognized on WROC Channel 8's Honor Roll and WHAM Channel 13's Bright Spot for their generosity and kindness. The students donated books to people in need through the WCA of Greater Rochester, and the DeWitt students wrote messages on the on stickers on the books, which were placed in the book covers. 
Yeah. yeah. Right. And yeah, I'll go ahead and move on to State Road. Um, a book fair hosted a, a pretty generous profit. Sticky Lips uh, fundraiser also hosted a great profit. Red Ribbon Week was promoted and CAD profits, Community Arts Day profits, were used to purchase framing for student artwork. And that's been displayed in the building and very well received by everybody who's seen it. And they have some upcoming meetings. Um, also, we can go through, I'll let you do Plank South and we'll come back to the secondary schools because mm -hmm. you've all been fairly involved with events there as well. Um, Plank South PTSA meeting was last Thursday, so unfortunately we had a we had a workshop, so I wasn't there. But I will be meeting with the fifth grade representatives and administration tomorrow. But I do have some dates that are coming up. They have a literacy <coughs> night uh, next Thursday at 6:30. It's called Literacy Around the World, and it's where they take different countries and showcase uh, literacy. There'll be cooking demonstrations, reading um, recipes out of books. They'll do some arts and crafts, but it's all tied into literacy. Um, the 40th anniversary for the science fair is coming up in March, so they're planning a big celebration for that. Their next meeting is February 6th, and there are chess clubs, yoga clubs, and roller skating going on all month long. It's very busy there. Uh, the next PTSA meeting for Clem South is Wednesday, uh, January 23rd at 6.30. But some of the events that have been happening at Clem South are, they recently had a speaker from uh, Schools for Sudan, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to providing educational opportunities for the villagers in the Republic of South Sudan. And there's a children's book entitled Child of Sand and Water that's a heartfelt story of overcoming tremendous activities or adversity in that country related to going to school, which is very appropriate for elementary uh, students. And the school will be participating in a fundraiser for this organization. Now, someone at Clem South has figured out that 900 cans of food can cover a football field from goal line to goal line. So they are going to have a Super Bowl contest to see if they can collect 900 cans of food. Uh, <laughs> Read Across America Day will be celebrated on March 1st, and the school is looking for some guest speakers. So I think I should put out a challenge to Mr. Gamina and Mr. Neenan to see if they can read better than myself. <laughs> and just so that you know, uh, Clem South is going to be a rest stop uh, for the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children in their participation participation in their 100 mile bike ride so that that will be coming up and um, the fifth graders recently were able to visit the district's greenhouse where they s learned firsthand how the aquaponic system works and how the cafeteria receives their fresh produce and finally during the cold days of winter uh, the snowflakes will be passed around Clem South with the messages of gratitude so you look for them around the school when you visit and I'll just kind of start in with the secondary. Last week, many of the board members did attend both Titan and uh, Warrior Day, and I have to say we were very impressed with the enthusiasm of the high school teachers and the students that were there as they encouraged the middle schoolers to take full advantage of the opportunities uh, provided at the high schools. I know many of us were able to attend that, and Maria was as well. And it was um, very exciting to see the kids in their home school welcome high school teachers and students who did a lot of the presentations as well and talking about the different pathways and so many opportunities. You could see them just kind of thinking and considering all the, all the things that they can be doing in high school. That was excellent. Awesome. literacy things that are happening in all our buildings. It just warms my heart when I hear that. <laughs> and then just briefly from Central PTSA, um, they are looking for help for the calendar, for the PTSA calendar to work on for next year. And the Candy Cane Locker Love initiative that was done at Thomas was very well received by all the kids. And I know there was a video that was um, on social media as well and they had a lot of volunteers so they want to keep track of and hold on to those volunteers that help tape up all the candy canes 
and I think we also, um, some of us were able to be part of the Model UN Day at Schrader. It was outstanding. In many classrooms, there, there wasn't even an adult present. And the kids who ran these events, the students who ran these events, served, served as the chair people, went through all the protocol and procedures that actually occurs and were just so well researched and so well spoken. And they followed Robert's rules of order at all times. <laughs> <laughs> we paid attention. Yes. So thank you. That wraps up all the school reports. Very busy and we've been able to be in have been invited to so many events in the buildings and we're very, very appreciative of that and very happy to see the progress of the students. Moving on to our liaison reports, um, Monroe County. Mm -hmm. Mike, do you wanna Yeah, I'll do labor relations because Linda wasn't able to catch that. Uh, we talked about the new requirements uh, which have become effective um, in October regarding sexual harassment and our district is presently working on a draft for board review. Uh, not only must we have a policy that deals directly with sexual harassment, but we also have to uh, train each of our employees in that policy. Uh, one thing to note about the new law, a supervisor or managerial personnel who knowingly allows sexual harassment behavior to continue can be held personally liable, which is a big, big change on that. Uh, I also want to thank Linda. Uh, she has agreed to serve on our um, the Monroe County School Board Budget Committee, uh, so we'll be meeting there. And um, our executive committee is not until February, so we won't get into that. And the only thing to add to the um, information exchange, the presentation was on cultural diversity, which tied in so well to Dr. McCarthy's report to us. Um, it was Dr. Cephas Archer from the Brockport College. Mm -hmm. He is the chief diversity officer and presented um, about considering all the different ways that we're diverse. It's not just race, and we learned that even within our own one Webster School District. So it was a very excellent presentation. It would be wonderful to have him come yeah. and speak mm -hmm. at either or both high schools if that were possible. And I think... Legislative. And legislative. Thank you, Jan. Uh, the December 10th Albany advocacy trip was canceled or actually postponed due to all the transitions going on in Albany. And we also canceled that January 2nd committee meeting. Um, the next big event is February 2nd, the legislative breakfast at Penfield Country Club, and I think many of us are signed up to go. I'm happy about that. Uh, but a two-day Albany trip, March 4th and 5th, is organized, and it'll be an opportunity to focus and follow up on key issues after our breakfast. And now that um, all the transitions are in place, that'll be a good time. The next meeting for work, uh, legislative committee will be Wednesday, February 6th. And we'll, we will be preparing for the breakfast at yeah. that, that meeting. No, the breakfast is before. Or February 2nd. No, I'll tell you what then, we better get a meeting before that so we're prepared for it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll make sure there's a meeting before. Oh, okay. There'll be a meeting before. We can't go into the breakfast without being prepared. Right. I saw the listing of which people are coming, so from right. a legislature. But. Mark Johns will be definitely is there. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I don't believe Pam Helming has responded yet. Yeah. yeah. Um, so. Yeah. so I'll, I'll make sure we have oh. that we're prepared for that meeting. Okay. So we'll, we'll get one in there because it's coming up Excellent. soon. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And we look forward to the next symposium. Yes. Yeah, so that one again. Well. We haven't. Uh, we're still trying to get a yeah. date. Happy New Year, and we're I all know it. <laughs> busy in finding dates. <laughs> On to the consent agenda. We've all had a chance to review all the items and documents within the consent agenda. Any questions or feedback from anyone? Then can we have a motion, please, to accept the consent agenda? So one of the items in the consent agenda 
is something that we should be celebrating, and that is the tenure for our deputy superintendent, uh, Mr. Neenan. Ah. And um, mm -hmm. as we've done with any senior admin, um, when they receive tenure, um, we normally, uh, you know, we, we look at their contract, and we also look to make sure that um, that they are at the median when compared to um, other um, other like senior staff members across Monroe County. Um, never above the median, but at the median. And so, uh, congratulations, Brian, on receiving tenure, and uh, we look forward to another decade together. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations. Did we have, we need, okay. So can we go back to a motion please to accept the consent agenda? So moved. Mike in a second by Jan, all in favor? Aye. Thank you, that's unanimous, motion carries. And now we may, we may have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Linda and second by Jan, all in favor? Thank you very much. See you at our next meeting, February 7th. Good night, everyone.